Okay, we'll go ahead and start. And we'll start by setting our motivation. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from higher rebirth and the bliss of liberation. May all sentient beings abide in a state of equanimity, free from attachment and hatred, free from holding some close and others distant. So connecting with love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. This, uh, this talk is um, hosted by Kunsang Yeshi Center in uh, New South Wales in Australia. And so it's really nice to see some old Australian friends and um, really uh, make strong prayers for the flourishing of Dharma in Australia and uh, particularly for all the little Dharma centers all over the world that especially have been struggling because of COVID and not having the influx of visitors and par kind of course participation that they've normally had. So, um, so really, whatever you can do to support your friendly local Dharma center, please do that because during these critical times, Dharma centers are really like hospitals for the mind and we really need them. So this particular public talk is going to be on intersections. And I think the word intersection is a very important word for us right now. We hear a lot about intersectionality when we're talking about understanding different levels of prejudice and discrimination. We talk about intersectionality with regards to understanding multiple traumas, but also I think it's interesting to kind of widen it up and talk in terms of humanity in general and the way in which we frame our experience. And the way we frame our experience or the big picture that we have in our mind of what is this all about is really interesting to look at because we all have a very different way of explaining the world to ourselves when things are good and when things are bad. And we all have very different ways of explaining our experience to ourselves in terms of self-soothing and in terms of being proactively altruistic. So the intersections I'm going to be talking about tonight are between religion and spirituality and between philosophy and psychology and the way they all kind of mix together and could even be put under the umbrella of something like Buddhism could combine all four of those. But it very much depends on what do you think each of those words mean. So just sitting for a minute kind of in a reflective way, when you hear the word philosophy, just in the abstract, what is your definition of philosophy? What connotations and emotional flavors and historical references come to your mind? Just kind of sit with that. Do you immediately go Greek? <laughs> do you immediately go Asian? Where do you go when you hear philosophy? Does it feel intellectual and logical? Or does it feel more visceral and experiential? Just kind of sitting with that. What does philosophy mean to you? And then building on that, do you identify as someone who practices philosophy or adheres to a philosophy? Just kind of like a self check in for a sec. Do I adhere to a philosophical belief system, whether an organized one that someone else created or my own internal system? Something trite but true, like all things shall pass, or something vast and intricate like the philosophical tenet systems of Buddhism. Do I feel like a philosopher? Okay, take that knowledge, put that to one side. <laughs> and now bring in the word psychology. When you hear the word psychology, what does it bring up for you? Very helpful and important, very indulgent and woo-woo. <laughs> when you think of psychology, do you think good for everyone, good for some, certain types excellent, other types nonsense? What does it evoke to you? Does psychology feel clinical or does it feel relational? Does it feel 
like something that is interactive and is not passive? Or does it feel like something you kind of passively take on as some form of healing like a pill? Just kind of like roll around the world word psychology. And as you bring the word psychology up to your mind, do you identify as someone who adheres to a psychological system of some kind? Big, broad, general, Freud-ish, Jung-ish? <laughs> Something very specific like CBT? Just really feel like, do I identify as someone who adheres to a psychology? Is that something I identify with? Or is it something that I can see as a tool but feel very separate from myself? Psychology. Okay. Putting that to one side. <laughs> and then take the dichotomy of religion and spirituality together. Do you feel like religion and spirituality have crossover or they are absolutely distinct? For you, the associations with those two words, does one feel more tight, the other feel more expansive? Does one feel more disciplined, the other feels more indulgent? Just kind of like move your mind back and forth between religion and spirituality. Are they friends within you? <laughs> Are they neighbors? Are they at war internally? And do you identify as someone who is religious or someone who is spiritual or both or neither? Just kind of like let that touch a self knowing for a sec. Okay. So as you're thinking about those things, just very quickly, you know, we're just kind of rolling around four words and they're four words that we've thought about our whole adult life probably. As you roll around those four words, does it become obvious to you that your definition of each of those four words is probably unique? Or at least has a uniqueness to it that might not be shared by every other English speaking person? Or do you think that your association with those words is a finite, containable definition agreed on by all? Right? Does it feel like, just as you're thinking about it, that they're not really trapped or contained or isolated into tidy definitions, that we all likely have a very different relationship with each one of those words? Did you feel resonance with one more than the other?
Is there a hierarchy? You put spirituality up top, then philosophy, then psychology, then religion at the bottom, or reshuffle. You put psychology at the top, little sprinkle of philosophy, some religion, some spirituality, but none of no one's business. Do some of them feel like more like my professional persona adheres to these and my personal one adheres to those? Yeah, Teresa. I can share for me. It's very interesting actually to think about that because in my own personal life, spirituality, religion, psychology, what was the other one? Was there four? Spirituality, Spiritual. psychology, religion, and philosophy philosophy right yeah so all of those I have come to terms with and I feel like there's a group of people who understand me but they're pretty it's a pretty small group religion's definitely at the bottom I liked your order I probably do spirituality philosophy psychology religion <laughs> But um, yeah, did I answer the question? I think I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we probably all have a hierarchy. Do you, do you guys agree? Some nods. We all have a hierarchy of which is the more important framing or the more applicable framing. Yeah. And I think that what we have to ask ourselves is, as soon as we identify as, does that build a bridge which helps us relate? Or does that disconnect and build suspicion? So for example, if I'm doing like an interfaith panel, right? You can imagine I've done any number of interfaith panels in my life, you know, and we've got um, people from the Muslim tradition and we've got people from the Jewish tradition and various forms of Christians. And because I was brought up Protestant and I have a Catholic father, I have more of an understanding of Christianity than the other religions but I also obviously left that. So I bring my own baggage to the conversation. But if I'm identifying as this group of people, this panel, this is us, people who have identified as religious. We all have identified as religious and that's a little weird in this world. <laughs> it's a little bit weird and it might be misunderstood and it might be looked down upon as something outdated and arcane and fundamentalist or it might be overly elevated as something magical and mystical and otherworldly but regardless of whether religion is put down or put up it's usually not looking at the individual who identifies as religious knowing that i feel immediate connection to all other religious people of any faith, right? Because I know we share that of people are gonna look at us funny. <laughs> yeah, we're weirdos in this world. They're gonna look at us funny. Now, I could just as easily be like, you're of other religions and so I feel distant from you. But as soon as you're in this shared conversation of, you know, what do we feel like is the meaning of life? We come down to the same basic points, even if our ways of getting there are different ways of getting there. And so by having a strong identity as one thing, it can immediately link you to other people you feel in resonance with, but it can just as easily be the distancing factor. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. And I, I certainly hear, and I picked religion out of all of the identities, even though I would identify as any of them, because it's the most rare, I think. And if I'm in a country, particularly like Australia, and you say to someone, are you religious? What are they gonna say? They're gonna say, oh, I'm a bit spiritual, right? In, in Australia, no one's gonna say they're religious in Australia unless they're full on fundamentalist something. I have never heard an Australian person say that they're religious. They're all spiritual. <laughs> Some of them are philosophers. See you, Jill. <laughs> right? Some of them are philosophers. But, you know, like no one's going to say they're religious because the vibe is heavy. Right? And the vibe is associated with various religious bureaucracies that have been very oppressive and really, really harmful to sentient beings. Even though that's not pervasively true, it's enough true enough of the time that there's a suspicion of authority and hesitation to identify as anything about that, right? 
So, so it's interesting to look at when you land on an identity, is it a bridge or is it a disconnect? Is it something that makes you color your experience in such a way that you have more ways to link to other sentient beings and expands the radius of feeling like us, I'm with us, or is it something that makes you more suspicious and paranoid? So Helen's saying all the labels are loaded and that's exactly the point. Every one of those labels is loaded, which is why we want to unpack them a little bit. So someone might say, um, look, I really have uh, no religion, no spirituality. I'm a secular humanist, but I believe in psychology. And even in framing it that way, isn't there an edge of superiority? Right? There's a little edge of, I know better. I'm a secular humanist. Religion is nonsense. Spir spirituality is frivolous. And uh, the only real thing is to understand psychology, even though it's a new soft science that's ever evolving. Nevertheless, there's an edge of superiority that you could get. If you said that, can you feel it? Right? You probably have friends in your life who have said that very thing in words to that effect, or you've been that friend. Or you say, oh, psychology is a bunch of rubbish. Right? Psychology is for people that just like to navel gaze. That's for people that want to blame their parents for everything. That's for people that can't handle their own stuff. Pull your socks up. Right? And, you know, and there's all these associations that it's somehow indulgent to acknowledge that feelings exist. And it's somehow indulgent to speak about them in such a way that someone else hearing you would be nice about it. <laughs> right? Because you in your life have never been allowed that, so then you resent them. Many examples, right? But I'm sure you can hear people in your life who might have that view, or you might have that view, right? And I, as I make all of these examples, what I'm trying to bring to life is the fact that there's a version of identification that we all do that creates barriers, that also creates arrogance, and creates the kind of patronizing or condescending vibe that makes it very hard to collaborate about what is truth, what is useful, what is going to make for a peaceful society, what's gonna accommodate people's different styles and affinities, what's gonna acknowledge and celebrate difference, while at the same time knowing there's a couple things that really work for you. And they are the best thing for you, but they're not the best thing. And that's me as a Buddhist nun who is religious saying Buddhism is not the best thing. It's the best thing for me, but it's not the best thing. We each have to ask ourselves that question. So identity is a huge piece of when we look at these four. The other piece is to ask yourself, I guess, to go a layer deeper and say, is it just identifying with or is it taking pride in because as soon as it's kind of i i pride myself in being a philosopher i pride myself in being psychologically oriented i pride myself in being spiritual etc then you're obnoxious right <laughs> and we all do this all of us do this we kind of like land in a camp and that camp makes us comfortable and I think this is something that we see really happening in an interesting way in a social setting when people are looking at intersectionalism with things like, I don't know, race, gender, and economics, for example. And you're suffering here today, is it because of your race, your gender, or your economics? Or is it because, you know, your spouse is a being, I don't know, stubborn? Or is it because it's too hot? Or any number of things. But the intersectionalism is a really interesting exploration of what is it exactly that was the catalyst for today's pain, or was it all of it together? And I think that that's the very important thing to come to is that it's always many things at once, but each of those things are still significant and worth speaking about. And the problem that happens with what we would call what woke culture or PC culture is that 
in an effort to be inclusive, in an effort to be kind, in an effort to be accommodating of people who have been vulnerable and disenfranchised, we actually start cutting off members of our own herd who aren't up to speed, who aren't saying the right words at the right time quick enough, who aren't evolving their speech patterns and their framework quick enough to sound like allies of whatever, right? And, you know, some of you will know this example, but the example I always give is, I don't know, 2008, was it? Whenever Obama was first running for president, I asked my grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, who only has an eighth grade ed education, who was an old farmer way out in Montana, cowboy, self-identified cowboy. I said, Grandpa, who are you going to vote for? He said, I like that colored fella. And I, you know, I could have said, Grandpa, don't say that word. Oh, don't say that word. That's really not what we say now. Or I could say, yeah, I'm going to vote for him too. You know, it's like, what point are you going to zero in on? The points of agreement, and then there's safety. And then there can be the gentle conversation of the reason we don't use that word anymore is dot, dot, dot. But, you know, we're going to all make mistakes. We're all going to forget goodwill is felt listen for the goodwill of people do you know what i mean and so you know i think that australian culture particularly is less prone to wokeness and pc culture than say california where i just was and um <laughs> in being in california i was reminded of how very american California is, <laughs> for better or for worse. And um, I was listening to um, the teacher of the school children at the Buddhist center where I was at. And the teacher said to the children, okay, global citizens, let's go. Cause she didn't want to use a gendered term. And I was cracking up and I thought, oh my God, global citizens are like five years old sitting on a stump. It was adorable, but I was like, oh my God, California, <laughs> right? It was ridiculous, but it was well intended, you know, and my little, you know, by this point, kind of Australian heart was rolling my eyes going, oh, what nonsense, what nonsense. But then part of me was trying to be objective and say, she's trying something here and it might be a little bit uptight and it might be a little precious. But there's a point there that is important for us to sit with and the kids are trying to tell us something important about the way that we affiliate ourselves with one gender or the other. They might be going too far, they might be making a big mishmash, they may be overcomplicating things, who knows what the kids are up to with their whole gender fluidity thing that they're on about these days, but there is a point in there which is worth exploring. So I'm not going to just write it off out of hand. I want to give it a minute to try and hear the truth in amongst all the ego. The truth in amongst all the ego and all of us have a whole bunch of ego around any idea we're excited about pretty much always. And so, you know, I was trying to kind of, you know, catch myself. Don't roll your eyes at the sweet young millennial you know, maybe Gen Z actually, teacher who was saying this to the cute little kids on the log. Why not just say girls and boys? Why not just say folks, global citizens, I tell you, right? <laughs> At the heart of it is something that is trying to be more expansive and inclusive of all of the spectrum and myriad of ways that people present and making it safe for more and more people to be themselves. And we can all get on board with that. So, you know, it's this whole thing where whatever example you can think of in your life of where you give yourself permission to cut someone from the herd. What is that? Yeah, what is that that gives you permission to cut someone from the human herd? And is it feeling like being inclusive and diverse and expansive and woke and intersectional enough? Or is it because you think they're being too conservative and they're being too uptight and they're being unkind and they're being prejudiced? There's a million reasons why we cut people from the herd, but I think in looking at all of these different ways we identify, it's to keep coming back to the ego likes to feel safe and secure and superior. So if I'm feeling safe, secure and superior, those should be like warning signs 
I'm got too comfortable. Yeah, it's not like we want to be agitated and anxious. I'm not saying that. But if we're feeling a little bit like smug, <laughs> that's a problem, isn't it? A little bit smug about how we identify. Yeah, we were just kind of wanting to sit with that. And being back in America has been very confronting because I, I had not realized how very hard on each other we are. We, you know, and I was trying to think about all this stuff around gun control, because in Montana, it's, it's even bigger than in a lot of parts of the country. We're weird. And I was trying to think, why is it that Australia, which has a good, good old macho cowboy culture, just like ours, it's a slightly different version, but you guys have that too, right? Like, kind of a macho thing. Why were you able to you know, change the government perspective on gun control after Port Arthur, and we weren't after the first mass shooting. What's the difference? I've been really thinking about that a lot. And I realize it's that Americans don't trust each other. We, we don't feel safe with each other. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, my heart's going out to Australia with all the floods and everything happening right now. And I remember the last time I was in floods in Australia, what was it like 2010 or something, 2011? And the way people just came together and shared stuff. And um, I was working on the Lifeline phones at the time and everyone was so collaborative and so kind. And I went to the grocery store and all of the shelves were empty and there were these big long lines. And I remember this one guy had like four loaves of bread and everyone's kind of looking at him like, really, four loaves of bread, really? And he kind of grudgingly was like, <laughs> giving some back to other people and then we're all laughing because we all could have been the guy that took four loaves of bread you know but there was like a lightness and a humor and a collaboration and I was just feeling such affection for Australians and such sadness about how Americans don't trust each other and that's why we can't get rid of our guns because we really do feel threat we feel like our government's gonna come after us. We feel like the other side, whatever that is, is gonna come after us. And we just have to be prepared. And what a, what a weird way to be. But it could happen to any of us. Any country could fall into that thinking where we're so paranoid, we don't even trust each other. What does each other even mean? You know, the two countries, Australia and America, are not that different socially in so many ways despite all of the differences I'm talking about with woke culture, the general things, we're very similar, same language, right? All these things, but yet there's two ways you can go. And I just really want us to think about how are my politics, how are my spiritual beliefs reinforcing my tendency to other others? And how much am I bringing people in and more people in and more people in, even just conversationally when we're talking about politics or logistically when you've been out running errands and someone was obnoxious to you at a supermarket. How are we framing our whole life in such a way that we're bringing more and more people into our heart. This is the real question when we're talking about intersections. Are there more people coming in or are we blocking more people. And it can happen in a million different ways. But one of the big ways that I think needs to be talked about more is in regards to if you would if you identify as religious or spiritual and you see those as contradictory, or you identify as psychologically based or philosophically based and you see those as contradictory and there's some sort of hierarchy. It doesn't even matter which one is on top. It's just the whole idea that one is better than the other when they're all tools for helping people have a big picture, which frames their life in such a way that their everyday troubles are put into some sort of perspective that's workable. Any one of those four you can turn into a fundamentalist with. Any one of those four can be an access point to what we might call spiritual bypassing, but it could be psychological bypassing or philosophical bypassing or religious bypassing where we have a beautiful framework. It's good and solid. It's got good logic. It's got good heart. And we know what the answer to our problem is. So we jump over our experience and jump to the end. 
I know that I'm supposed to be patient right now. So rather than acknowledging I'm angry, I'm going to pretend I'm already patient. <laughs> or I know I'm supposed to reframe the suffering I'm having right now. So I'm going to pretend that it's already reframed and that the suffering is gone and jump all the way through my actual experience in this moment, trying to cut to the chase, go to what I know the end is supposed to be. And in doing that, you become less and less genuine, less and less authentic, and more and more separated from society and other human beings. If your own experience becomes foreign to you, because you keep jumping over it to get to the, you know, conclusion of your philosophical system or your psychological system or whatever, if you keep jumping over it, then you're, it's going to be harder for you to see the way you're just the same as everyone else. It's just the style is different. Yeah. So this is something that's been happening to us a lot with the pandemic, I think, is that there's a million ways to disconnect from our present moment. There's a million ways to self-soothe and avoid and distract. And a lot of those ways don't involve other people in our space. They involve a screen. And when you keep relating to something that is not human, <laughs> what can happen is that humans start to feel more and more foreign. And the more people start to feel foreign, the more you kind of implode into your radius of us feeling smaller and smaller and smaller until even some of the other people in your house are other. You only like one of the people in the house, the other person in the house you don't like. It gets smaller, 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 and it just collapses in until you can't even bear to be with yourself. So then watch more Netflix because who wants to feel that? So it's just all about kind of landing on what is the system that's going to keep you in the biggest picture while being present with your own individual experience? Do you, do you agree with that framing that you're when you're the most emotionally and intellectually healthy, when you feel the most contentment, it's when you have a big picture as well as being individually present with what's going on for you. You're self aware, but you're not self absorbed. Right? You're not pretending your stuff isn't going on, but whatever your stuff is, is put in the correct perspective. Do you have any thoughts so far or questions so far that's coming up? Hi, um, sorry about my lack of video. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, Helen, go ahead. I'm horrible with technology, so my apologies. Um, <laughs> um, Everything you've been saying is amazingly spot on for me at the moment, and particularly the thing you just said about the relating to things that aren't human. I'm finding, having worked from home now for a long period of time, um, even the idea of going back into face-to-face -face, uh, relationships is quite challenging, um, and knowing how to be resilient, uh, resilient around that. Um, and definitely the compartmentalizing of ideas, it has become more extreme with, you know, the pandemic and, and everyone deciding that they know what's true, um, and what's right. And, um, I'm finding it all horribly challenging. And so definitely stepping outside of that and taking a bigger picture view of what's really important has been essential for keeping me sane uh, don't always uh, succeed but <laughs> certainly um these feel like the big issues and I have a young son too so trying to navigate his world in this world is very hard yeah yeah it is and I guess what would you say is kind of a surefire way to release stress and tension and paranoia and all of those things that can happen when you notice them. I mean, the turn hard part off. is noticing them, right? <laughs> but yeah. Turn, turn off, off, turn off your phone, turn off your TV, stop looking at the computer, stop reading the news, just go outside and yeah. play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. And the essence of that is get back into an expansive modality. So, you know, so this is what I want us to sit with is whether it's screen based or not, the screen is not the problem. It's the mentality we bring to it. 
and almost by virtue of the size of the screen kind of invites a narrow focus, doesn't it? Yeah. But it doesn't have to. I mean, we're in a class right now talking about big expansive ideas, but what you're saying about like, go outside, go play, it seems like the most obvious common sense advice. And yet there's a deep profundity there. I think we sometimes miss. And we think it's the going out and the playing that fixed it. What's fixed it is that those two things create a wide focus. And the more narrow your focus, the more stress you have. The more self-focused you are, the more stress and depression you have. And it becomes a vicious circle because you're trying to get yourself out of your depression or get yourself out of your anxiety or out of your stagnation by focusing more and more on yourself on yourself. When of course what you need is to go outside and look at the sky, but it's not yeah. about going outside or the sky. It's about by doing that, you release the focus and expand the focus. And by doing that, the stress is less. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's great to have these reminders. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think we do need to collaborate about these things because there's uh, extra elements at play that are new, like the pandemic situation. Yeah, Teresa, go ahead. Uh, I think the thing that's most helpful for me is when you said the ego likes to feel superior. And for me, I was like, is it philosophical or spiritual or psychology, psychological or religious? It's all of them. Actually, this understanding for me that my ego can never be satisfied. It doesn't matter what I do. And so once I recognize that, then it can all drop. But when I'm still striving, I want to feel superior to you. I want to feel safe. I want to feel, and the way I'm going about it, it's not going to actually achieve those things. That feels like the real freedom for me. And that's the expansive, that what I think I have to fear, I don't actually have to fear. It's not real. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that there's, um, you know, built into this whole public talk is an assumption that all of us have some sort of identification with one of those four, right? And one of those four, whether it's religion, spirituality, philosoph philosophy, or psychology, those are all kind of symptoms or causes of living an examined life, versions of living an examined life. Yeah, all different ways of living an examined life. And my built in assumption is living an examined life is better. <laughs> and my ego is saying, one of those four is superior, right? Long as you pick one of those four, you're one of the good guys. And if you don't pick one of those four, you are lowly, which is not true. Like how many people are there that don't live an examined life that just take life for granted, get on with their work, get on with their life, are good to their family, good to their friends, excellent neighbors, considerate shirt off the back, but they're not thinking about the big picture or the deep questions. And why should they? Their life is okay. They don't have to, to be good. They don't have to, to be happy. You know, so anytime we start to centralize is then the invitation to reopen. You know, I was thinking about like, here I am out in the country visiting my folks in Montana and I'm surrounded by, um, you know, people who have different be beliefs <laughs> of all types. Um, there are unironic cowboy hats. There are flags up on poles. There are Trump bumper stickers. And there is, you know, that kind of vibe. And yet I know the neighbors on either side including the guy that shoots gophers from his porch, including him, <laughs> would totally help us if our pipes froze and our house flooded. I know they would. Even me dressed as I am right in this second, I know they would give me the shirt off their back. You know, I know that if our horses got loose, they would help us catch them and protect them. I know they would. So it's like, you know, whether they live an examined life or not, I'm assuming they don't because of the way they speak and the way they act, that may or may not be true. Say it is true, does it make them less? No, it doesn't, not at all. And even me branding them in that way has the, the whispers and the shadows of my othering of them. And that's what I wanna dive into again and again until 
I feel affinity with them in the same way as I do with all of you or with another Buddhist nun or whoever is like one of us, right? Just to keep opening and reopening and deep opening again and again, because for better or for worse, I've chosen to live an examined life. <laughs> and so I better examine it thoroughly and well, while at the same time, not judging people who don't, because it doesn't mean they're doing any worse than me. <laughs> Right, and yes, indeed, my neighbors might be bodhisattvas, someone has put in the chat. I think it's quite likely, although I wish they wouldn't kill the gophers with the 22. I really wish he wouldn't, but that doesn't mean he's a bad person. Right, and what is a bad person anyway? So all these issues are the things that we kind of like keep, keep coming back to again and again, so that we're calling people in rather than calling people out and finding reasons to call them out. The thing to sit with, I think, is to keep looking at is whatever I'm doing with my mind and my identification creating an open and spacious enough experience that I'm able to hold simultaneous truths and that I'm able to hold seemingly contradictory paths while knowing that I myself do have certain things that are good for me. And nailing those down and identifying them clearly is healthy and useful. Pretending I don't believe in anything and that I'm just so spacious and so accommodating, that loses power. That creates no momentum. There is no depth in being that expansive. But when you have a belief system, it has to be like the launching pad for your expansiveness. You can't just be expansive without some sort of touchstone or launching pad. Do you know what I mean? So it's a gradual process of just kind of landing on beliefs and then letting them go into more expansiveness and then landing again and getting more expansive. But to keep coming back to, have I blocked my heart? Am I feeling superior? Am I feeling smug? Am I starting to cut people from the herd again? What is that about? And is that moving towards the greater good? Is that moving towards a more harmonious society? And on my deathbed, bed, will I be proud of those habits? Or will I be disappointed in all of the people that I removed my heart from and said, sorry, you don't get my affection or my respect, sorry. Like a punishment, you know, how is that helping? What challenges are you having with people right now in terms of how you brand them. Yeah, so when you're having a challenge with someone and you feel that conflict, what do you say in your mind that kind of justifies your annoyance? They're just the kind of person that dot, dot, dot. Those people just dot, dot, dot. Um, for me, it's a story about that living with like-minded people being, spending more time around like-minded people feels so good that sometimes I think in my own mind, this is better, they're better. Yeah. Because I'm at this moment in my life, I'm enjoying it. And so I think it's that the, like it is actually quite nice that there's an important part of being around like-minded people, but it doesn't make us better than others, just different. Yeah, and that's, that's one of those weird, almost paradoxes that I'm always curious about because haven't you found that when you're, you're feeling like the other, how desperate you are to find your people? right? Whoever your people are. And then you find your people and you're with your people and then dramas unfold, right? And you find ways to nitpick each other and you find ways to have micro exclusions, you know, like these four against those four. And you're all under the umbrella of, you know, the same people, but somehow still you find ways to other each other, even in one community. And that's what I always find so fascinating because there's been millions of times in my life where I just feel like I want to be around people where I can let my hair down, where I can just be myself, where I can be authentic, right? And no one's going to judge me. I can just let it all hang out. And then finding those people, 
you get two seconds of relief and then immediately the same old problems arise. And I think this is the knowing that we all have somewhere in the back of our mind, but we forget that we know it. We forget that we know it, but we do know something wise, which is as soon as you feel like you're with your people, you relax. So how do you make it feel like you're with your people always? This is the thing. And, you know, it can be such odd things like when, like when I first came to Australia, I remember I was on a train and um, there was a guy across from me with a Chicago Bulls t-shirt and he looked like really athletic. And I thought, I bet he's American, an American. If I was, if I saw the exact same guy in America, I'd be like, athlete, I am not an athlete, right? Same guy would not have felt the same heart connection, but because I was feeling like a fish out of water, I saw this guy who I assumed to be of my nationality and I felt connection. And I, then I was like, let's, I'm going to sit by him. He's going to understand my accent. <laughs> like, so, so silly, right? But it's that, cre it's, it's all a mental dance of how do you create your own safety by feeling the affinity with other human beings? How do you find the ways that you're like them? Because that makes your heart release. And we are like each other so deeply and so fundamentally. So sitting with that, like, how am I like the person I disdain? How am I like the groups of people that scare me? How am I like the people that have hurt me? How am I like them? How are we the same? It sounds so cliche, and yet there's such a deep power in that because the first benefit is to you. You're not so stressed. And then when you're not so stressed, creativity is open back up, all sorts of possibilities open back up, and you're much easier to be with. Yeah, and then you create this ra radius of like relaxation around you. Like what happens when you're in the grocery store in a line and it's a stressful day and the school kids have just gotten out and it's all clangy and bright and annoying and smelly and people and then someone in the line chooses to break the ice and talk to someone else in the line. And for a moment, everyone's like, oh, they've broken the social contract. They're talking to a stranger in public. Are they okay? And then everyone just chills out and starts talking to each other in the line at the grocery store and then you come back happy because someone was brave enough to break the ice yeah but the social contract is be suspicious of strangers when hardly any strangers are dangerous there's a couple that are and you'll probably figure it out quite quickly you're a rational adult <laughs> right but we're almost programmed to assume Everyone is unsafe, except for just a couple that we know or who look exactly like us in some way. Do you agree? There's some sort of like socialization of be prepared, be afraid, be paranoid. Yeah, as the default, right? Rather than assume people are probably fine. Every once in a while, they'll have a screw loose and something, you know, dodgy will start happening and they're going to want to take advantage of you. But generally, people are not so bad. Okay. And in cultures where that's more of an assumption, it's a lot easier to do errands, right? Let alone live. You know, I was, I was at the chemist in Israel once and I was trying to read the little tiny console of how much it was and it was in shekels and I was trying to get used to shekels and it was a whole thing. And the person next to me just said, oh, that's about $5 in, in US dollars. So, you know, don't worry about it. It's not that much. And I was like, thanks. And, you know, one, they were looking at the price of my items. How dare they? Two, they were making a comment and advice. <gasps> that is not the social contract. <gasps> But it was really helpful and it was nice and I had a nice day then, <laughs> right? So like these social contracts, they're nonsense. And yet we have such a like, I don't know, default position of fear with other people. So it, the question of the day is really how to keep widening the radius of who you consider my people, who you consider to be your tribe. Yeah, wide the radius of us. This is us. This is us. 
until no one is not us. Do you feel any kind of like niggling like, oh, that sounds really sweet and lovely, but no, I don't think that's gonna work. Do you have any kind of like, uh, yes, but feelings that you would like to share? Yes, but, yes, but. And I yeah. butt in again, I found my video, yay. Um, a hundred percent, I, um, I struggle most with that we're all connected idea because I love the idea and I really aspire to the idea and I really get challenged to actually do it in the real world. So I try to, I tend to get along with people generally most of the time, but in terms of my tribe, I just don't feel I even have a tribe that I have all these disparate people in my life, none of which I could get together in one room without it becoming a big you know, explosion of opinion. Um, <laughs> so um, I really struggle with that. And I understand it conceptually. I understand the, the benefit of it, but yeah, actually really doing it, I find very difficult practically. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, it is. And it is weird. Probably a lot of us have that experience of, we have a lot of people in our life a couple of them are sort of close, but if we put everyone we had a connection with in a room together, it wouldn't necessarily be pretty. <laughs> it could actually kind of go sideways real quick. And you think, wow, I hold all of these affinities within one little person. Isn't that odd that there's not resonance then with them amongst themselves? Isn't that odd? But so much of it is context and so much of this practice that we're doing is this internal conversation of no one else has to understand, agree, or adhere to this world system for this world system to bring me peace and to make me more effective as a human being in society. No one has to understand or agree what I'm on about. That's not even the point. It's not making interconnection. It's that it, we're revealing the fact interconnection is the fact. Yeah, we are interconnected, whether we want to be or not. Yeah, completely. And so, you know, systems like psychology try to build connections between people. Buddhism is trying to reveal the fact that those connections have always been there. And both strategies are needed. Both ways of looking at the world are helpful. The question is internally, why is it some days we feel isolated and alienated from our fellow man doing the same exact set of errands as a different day where we feel very connected and in the flow. Nothing has really changed at the supermarket. Nothing changed in the parking lot, but something is different in our heart on the days that we're stressed and the days that we aren't. And what are we bringing to the fact of interconnection? So, you don't have to get everybody together and, and have a party and hope that they'll get along. It's that internally you're creating more and more possibilities where you could enter their party and be in resonance. Maybe they'll never be able to all come to yours, but you could go into theirs and theirs and theirs and find points of connection and contact and ways to be, I guess, seen and respected and loved because you got good social skills, you're a nice person. That's really quite ahead of the game. <laughs> you're a nice person, good social skills. You can make friends. It just takes effort, right? Sometimes we forget that as adults. We haven't made a lot of new friends as adults. Yeah, Joanne, what do you think? It's funny, just what you were saying and what Helen was saying before, that if she got all the disparate people in her life into the one room, it could be really ugly. And I, I just thought, <laughs> look at any wedding. I mean, <laughs> yeah. a wedding is the perfect example of two people getting all their disparate people in the same room. And how often does that go pear-shaped? Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, I was thinking about how I missed living in a nuns community when I lived at Chen Resig Institute in Australia, and there was just like a whole mob of nuns. And then I remember nuns meetings, and like, we did not agree on much. Mm. We just agreed on Buddhism's good, vows are important. <laughs> yeah. That was about it. And then we would disagree about everything else. And we were nice yeah. about it, you know, but 
like what do you really have in common with anyone on the surface right at the depths we have so much in common with every single sentient being we want happiness we don't want suffering but my goodness the details are disparate the details are so different from each other and you know all of us taken out of context seems so strange yeah if we were taken out of our context and plunked into a very different culture everyone would think we were so weird and that why we think what we think is so weird right but plunked into our own context plenty of people are like oh yeah that makes sense can i just make a quick comment that I've yeah I think when I'm having my really bad connected days with other humans and I really struggle to like them, I think about them as babies. That's, a, that's the easiest way I can relate to everyone as one, as the same, is that they were all babies once. Everyone was a baby once and vulnerable and helpless. And it's the only way I can like some people some days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that is... That is very skillful, and I would challenge you to elevate it to see them all as mothers. And that because that has an association of elevation and respect. Babies is perfect because it's, you know, vulnerable. And so that softens you. But there's also a little bit of you poor dear. <laughs> pat, 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 you poor dear. Right? Whereas if their mother, and of course, like all of us have complicated relationships with our mother, but almost imagine yourself as the baby being taken care of by so and so and so and so. And for some people, you'd be like, no! <laughs> right? But for a lot of people, if you picture them holding a baby, it softens something. And you can see something soften in them just by picturing that. And then, you, okay, you imagine this person you really dislike holding a baby. What if that baby was you? And the incredible vulnerability and the need for safety and the need for support that you would have as that tiny baby with that problematic person. Almost all people rise to the occasion when given something so vulnerable. And it's a very hard case that doesn't. It's someone who's really conditioned themselves to negativity. And you know, true psychopaths, true sociopaths are very rare. They're very rare and they're also not a lost cause, although that life might be a bit of a wash. <laughs> it's gonna take a while. But you know, the true psychopath is very rare. Most people have that wish to be kind somewhere deep in there. And if they have kind of a, a default, let's see what we can get out of this. Let's take things for granted. Let's try and get what we can out of people, kind of unfortunate modality often is not that is born from some trauma or some pretty strong socialization from their family, but offering another way, gradually they'd probably synchronize into that happier. You know, it's just, it's having that, that difficult thing where you have healthy skepticism, you have strong common sense, but you're not letting it slip into cynicism. Yeah, you know, skeptical, healthy checking good common sense but not cynicism not jaded and it's so so easy for us to become hard-hearted when people have done us wrong when it could be the very thing that softens us to the human condition and we're reminded once again of how much we're all hurting and you actually feel more connected having been hurt rather than more hard having been hurt it's a possibility keep widening the radius of us. And um, again, please support your Dharma centers so that those communities and those safe places can kind of reassert themselves in your life. And uh, for there not to be any kind of competition or turf wars, may the vibe be collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. So thank you, Yontan, for yeah, thank um, you very much. continuing to be our spiritual friend and um, connecting to Australia and connecting to the Blue Mountains where you are still fondly remembered and dearly loved and we hope that it's not too long before you come back again and may we have positive thoughts for Ukraine and poor old Vladimir Putin yeah yep here here <laughs> yep here here all right we'll dedicate may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen, arise and grow. 
May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Toni dawarim boshe, ma ke panam ke gyuchi, ke pan yam pa me pa hir, gone gondu pelwan shu. See you guys. Thank you so much, Venerable. It was amazing. Thanks. Thank so. you. Have a good day or night, folks. Bye. <laughs> mm.